Before we start, my niece is with me today and she wanted to say hi to all of y'all. Can she come say hi? Of course. Hi. Hi, what, what's your name? Hi, pretty. What's hi. your name? My name's Alia. Hi, Alia, how are you? Okay. We're gonna come to law school with me, right? Wait, what, what, what's, what's her last name? Where, where, where is she on the roll today? Where's she put in? Is she on call today? <laughs> Now she's going to be drawing, but she did just want to come say hi to all of y'all because she was excited about coming to class with me. Oh, that's very sweet. Well, welcome. Are you ready to learn? Yeah, we're ready. Okay, to learn. good. Thank you. Okay, the attendance is running. Just tell her to sign and turn on her eye clicker, okay? It's funny, every, um, you know, when we actually have class in person, um, I often, uh, people bring their kids to class and, um, <laughs> One year I was doing the uh, class in the First Amendment where we do the uh, cursing. We have lots of F-bombs dropping in class. And this, this, I'll spare you. Um, but this one student, she brought her little daughter and she was just laying with her iPhone, you know, just looking at it, <laughs> blocking off the world. I was like, oh, it's, you're here. It, 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 it's, it's reality. Okay. Um, Uh, today is our last class. Um, oh, no, no. Well, it's our last scheduled class. Our actual last, last class is tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to do a makeup. So same link, same everything else. Tomorrow at uh, 1030, everything exactly the same. And we'll do the last... Um, uh, we'll do the last um, uh, topic, which is the gay marriage cases. Um I scheduled a um, a review session. It was on the sixth or the seventh? I can't remember what I said. It's on my calendar. On, on the sixth, so it's on Sunday, the sixth at um, noon. Same link. Uh, I'll go over one of the old final exams. I'm not sure which one yet. I have to decide. I'll, I'll let you know by email which one I'd like to go over. Um, uh, to to go over final exams. Um, uh, office hours today, uh, right after class, um, you're welcome to say I, I'm happy to go over old exams. That's today. That's your deadline. Um, my cutoff for questions will be two, two days for the exam. So on the 10th, um, I find that the questions right before the exam tend to be very panicky and people are freaking out. They don't know what they're doing and they're not very good questions. Um, if you want to meet during the finals period, email me. I'm happy to set up a time. Um, Zoom makes it a lot easier. It used to really suck trying to meet with people. Uh, in person during the exam period, because always odd times they want to meet. But with Zoom, I should be pretty flexible. Uh, yeah, everything's recorded. Everything's recorded. Everything's recorded. Uh, you can watch it anytime. Okay. All right. Questions? No? All right. Uh, let's try and do a series of um, poll questions today. Uh, here's the questions. Uh, Otter is not working today. It's actually a, a reason I figured out. Um, Otter limits you to, I think, a certain number of minutes a month. And I'd actually left it running on all my weekend visits where I talked to you for eight hours on the weekend. So I basically burned my entire quota for the month. Um, <laughs> I didn't anticipate that, but I used my entire quota. So I can't use Otter at the moment. I apologize. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to um, uh, transcribe today's class um, later after my quota resets, but I just I can't use the software. Like it's, it's, it's actually locking me out. It's kind of annoying. I can't even use it. All right, there we go. Uh, so I apologize for that, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to it later. All right, so let's do a series of poll questions to see how well we understand um, our readings from last week. So let's do question number one. Um, okay, so here's question number one. Under Roe v. Wade, the standard in Roe, what... Oh, I'm sorry, that should be a short answer. Scratch that, sorry. Under Roe v. Wade... What restrictions on abortion can the state impose during the first trimester, during the first three months?
Okay. Um, who is who is next on the roll? That would be me. Good morning. That's- Good morning. How are you? Okay, I'll call you in about ten seconds. Okay. Okay. We're not quite there yet. But we're almost there. All right. All right. Uh, all right. Go go for it. All right. So what's your answer here? Uh, I said that the state can only regulate the qualifications and license, licensing of doctors and facilities that provide abortions. Okay. I think that's right. Let me just make it clear. What do you mean regulate the licensing and qualifications? What, what does that mean? Um, like they can regulate the required licensing or regulations that doctors need in order to give abortions. So for example, admitting privileges to hospitals. Yes, that's relevant for today. Yeah. Uh, No, I'm asking the question, right? Okay. Um, so you said that during the first trimester, the state can regulate the qualifications. Can the state require a doctor have admitting privileges? Can they require that the facilities they use have certain standards? Um, <laughs> within this, yeah, because it, has, uh, I'd say yes, because it hasn't been further refined too, I guess. Uh, okay. Very right. Well, good. All right. Thank you, Gavin. Um, I'm giving Gavin a hard time, you know, two minutes of the class quite deliberately. Uh, what you're going to find is that the abortion cases are not, um, a straight line. They, they sort of zigzag. What Rose said in the first trimester, the state can regulate the qualifications and licensing of doctors. But, and here comes a big but, those qualifications cannot be used to restrict abortions in order to protect fetal life. Again, you can impose qualifications and licensing requirements. But you can't use those as a means to restrict abortion access if you're trying to protect fetal life. These have to be just generic rules that all surgeries are subject to, that all doctors are subject to. You can't impose abortion-specific qualification requirements to protect fetal life. The key point of Roe's first trimester is that the state has no interest in protecting fetal life. Okay. Right, they cannot stop, I'm sorry, they cannot impose some sort of uh, abortion restriction to try to limit abortion, right? It has to be a generic health requirement. The upshot is that during the first trimester in a row, the state has no power to restrict abortion. I mean, it, 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 there's almost no circumstance under Roe you can do it in the first trimester. All right, questions on that one. All right, let's try question number two, predictably. The second trimester, what sort of restrictions can the state impose during the second trimester under Roe? And if my roster is correct, the cash is up next, I think. So I'm going to give you about 20 seconds for cash. All right, Bukash, you here? Yes, sir. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Thank you. Um, all right. So what's your answer here, my friend? So for this one, it's the state is looking to protect the mother's health um, month three onwards. So the question was, what 
restrictions on abortion can the state impose during the second trimester? So I guess any laws that are enacted to promote the mother's health. Correct. Very good. Thank you so much for cash. That's right. Um, during the second trimester, the state has additional latitude. The state can restrict abortion as a way to protect the mother's health. So let's say there's a um, specific type of abortion procedure that poses a risk to uh, risk of complications, right? Perhaps the state can restrict that procedure, but it cannot prohibit abortion outright from the second trimester, right? It can only take certain restrictions to um, protect the, the woman's health. Okay. Are any questions on that second one? All right, let's finish up our quiz and do the third one. Okay. What restrictions are permissible in the third trimester? Mm -hmm. There's going to be uh, Bryce about 20 seconds. All right, Bryce, you here? No, Bryce? Clay, you here? No, Clay? Matt, you here? Good morning, Professor. I'm here. Thank you. Okay. All right, Matt, what's your answer here? So on this one, I said, um, you know, third trimester, you pass the point of viability. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Let, me, let me just pause right there. What do you mean you pass point of viability? Just just spell that out for us, please. Sure. So um, the point of viability is where the kind of the line in the sand that the Supreme Court has drawn to where uh, the state has the most power to uh, make regulations banning uh, abortion. No, I, I, what does viability mean? You gave me a correct answer. Just what? Uh, what? It, sorry, sorry. It's where the uh, I guess greatest instance or greatest chance of, of fetal life is. Fetal life where? Um, what, what does viability mean? Just people might know what that word means. What does viability um, mean? That it's likely that the child will live or, or could live if, 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 if it's carried to, uh, no, 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 no. That's not what viability means. What does viability mean? It's not about uh, living in the womb. What's viability asking about? Okay. Yeah. Vi I'll come back to you, Matt. Viability okay. means can the fetus survive outside the womb? That there's a premature delivery. Would the fetus survive? Right? I mean, uh, thanks, Matt. I'll come back. To, I'll, I'll go to the next person in a minute. Um, I, I make this point because everyone knows what these terms mean. Right? Uh, the general term for pregnancy is nine months, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, uh, sometimes, for one reason or another, uh, women go into labor early. It happens for good reasons, happens for bad reasons, right? Sometimes um, if there's a, um, uh, some sort of a birth defect or some abnormality, the body basically goes into labor early uh, to take care of it. And, um, you know, if the, if the delivery happens too early, um, then the baby can't survive outside the womb. It dies quickly or... Not so quickly, but it, it will pass away. Um, in Roe, the court identifies the six-month mark as the mark for viability. It says at six months, that means the baby could be viable outside the womb. Um, now, that's a number that changes. And, and you know, I, I every year I ask this question, I don't even know what the answer is now, but every year neonatal care, neonatal means for newborn babies, like really young, you know, um, 
you know, the, 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 the neonatal care um, allows earlier and earlier uh, babies to survive. Uh, so the, the mark of viability um, is not, you know, set in stone at six months. And indeed, we'll see in the second case, Casey, that the uh, mark changes, right? But the court in Roe did draw the line of viability. Um, so now let's go back to oh, Jose. You hear Jose? Jose? All right. Oh, bad attendance today. Spencer. It's not good. People are amazing. Grace, are you here? Okay, we have a problem. You guys will need your own call. If, if, this is really, really not good for the last day of class. Colin, you here? I am, sir. Look at that. Four in a row. What people say, I have, I have free absences the last day of class, I'll just skip. Do something else. What a terrible idea. I mean, that's just, I mean, I, I think in all of law school, I missed two classes. Maybe three. I think they were for interviews and stuff. I just I I, I never miss class. Um, I just I, I don't understand. You're paying a lot of money to be here. At least you're on Zoom, but you can at least sit in. All right, Colin. So what's the answer to this third question? What restrictions are permissible for the third trimester? We got the viability point, but what what's the answer here? So they can restrict uh, abortions to protect the actual fetal life. Okay. Now let's just be clear here. What does it mean to restrict abortion to protect fetal life? What does it actually practically mean? You are going to restrict the everything that has come before in the two trimesters, so the doctors, the safety procedures. You're going to enact um, policies that are going to promote the health and safety of that fetus. And what might that entail to protect the, the, the safety of the fetus? What, what might that actually entail? Um, I mean, I guess any number of things, it, it could be the, uh, at least for the cases today, it could be the actual, um, like the actual procedures themselves. Okay. They can regulate how the abortion is performed, but what else can the state do? Uh, I mean, it could restrict who can actually conduct the abortion. You're, you're dancing around the, 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 the you're dancing around the issue. What could the state do? Anything it wants in order to protect. And the what's the most what's the most obvious thing the state can do to protect the fetal life? Uh, to prevent a woman from actually getting an abortion. Yeah, a ban, right? Okay, you, you're dancing around the issue. You're right. They, they could ban it altogether. Yes. In, in, uh, in theory, at least. Come back to the minute, right? And ju just to be clear, when you say you ban abortion, legal abortions, that basically says... Um, a woman has to carry the, the child to term, right? In other words, unless something else intervenes, which is always possible, there are miscarriages, things, things happen. As far as the state's concerned, the woman carries it to term. All right, thanks, Colin. He, he, I took, it took you a little prodding to get there, but eventually you got there, right? Now, Rose said that you could ban abortion in the third trimester to protect the life of the fetus, that is, let the fetus come to term. But the carve-out, and this is an important carve-out, is that the state has to take into consideration the mother's uh, life or health. That is, let's say a pregnancy might kill a woman, uh, then abortion cannot be banned, right? And there are certain cases where a, a delivery could actually kill a person. It, it, you know, it, it happens. It's, it's tragic, but it happens. Um, the other one is health, right? This one's a little more tricky, that if a woman's health might be adversely affected, you cannot ban it. And this, 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 this is an exception that swallows the rule, um, you know, people have hypertension, you know, uh, preeclampsia, um, you know, gestational diabetes or their entire host of ailments that are usually attendant to, to pregnancy. And, and usually you can find a doctor to write you a note. So the, the third trimester, you could ban it, was, was more in theory than in practice. It never actually worked. Um, so practically speaking, um, Roe allowed abortions at all nine months of the pregnancy. It didn't quite say that, but that's more or less what it means. And in some states you do have, even today, uh, ninth month abortions. So they're, they're pretty rare. Uh, I think they're, they're very rare. Usually at that time you just deliver it. Uh, but they exist. Right. Roe also did some other things. 
Um, Roe never used the phrase strict scrutiny, right? Uh, but it was widely understood that Roe was reviewing abortion laws with strict scrutiny. It didn't say it. Uh, you know, you can look at Justice Blackman's opinion. He doesn't say the word. Um, Roe also characterized abortion as a fundamental right that triggers strict scrutiny. Right? That, that when you have these rights that are so important that you have to review them very skeptically, laws that burden them skeptically. Okay, so we have the holding of Roe, at least you think we do. We have this trimester framework where number one, number two, number three, what can you do, what you can't do. You have this fundamental right. You have uh, reviewing with strict scrutiny. And that's how Roe was understood for about you know, 20 years. All right. Questions on Roe? Questions on Roe? All right. Good review. Thank you all. All right. Let's move on to today's material. Um, today we start the modern abortion cases. We have three cases I've assigned for you. Um, plan. Parenthood versus Casey from 1992. Uh, Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstedt, 2016. Pretty recent. And then the third one, hot off the press, is uh, June Medical versus Russo, 2020. The case is only a few months old. Um, I think I told you when we studied affirmative action that the cases that are most likely to be changed, what the precedent is, will be affirmative action given the new court. I think abortion is right behind affirmative action. I don't know how I'll be teaching this case in two years. I, I don't know. I suspect it will be something different. If I had to predict what's going to happen on the Roberts Court, which is always very dangerous, uh, but if I had to predict what's going to happen, the court will say that Holman's health is not good law, and we go back to a more deferential version of Casey. Um, I think the court basically says Holman's health, which was only, uh, you know, which, which was this sort of this uh, placeholder opinion after Scalia died, is not good law. It, it was inconsistent with Casey, and the court waters down the Casey standard undue burden. That that'd be my prediction of what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if that means practically what law survival don't, but I do think that this area is probably. Um, Changing, which will mean that in, in more liberal states, abortion laws will remain exactly the same. In California, New York, there'll be no difference. Uh, Texas is made a closer call. I'm not sure. The politics are changing somewhat. But in Mississippi and Alabama, yeah, the laws are going to change. Um, and I think the legislature is going to get, with, get away with more uh, uh, than they are um, right here. All right. Um, and, of course, the key reason why this has happened is because of Justice Kennedy's replacement. Justice Kennedy was a swing vote in Casey. He was a deciding vote in Holman's health. And he is not on the court anymore. And less than a year after his retirement, we had, we had June Medical, where the chief basically says, well, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, but come back at me next time. All right. Um, so let's start with Casey. Um, the excerpt in your book of Casey is very long. And remarkably, it doesn't actually tell the facts of the case. It's such a long opinion that we had to even edit out the facts, which is somewhat tricky. But let me give you a little bit of background. Um, throughout the 1980s, um, conservatives set their eyes on Roe, and they focus on trying to overrule it. And uh, President Reagan and H.W. Bush made several appointments to the court to try to move the needle to get Roe overruled. By the time you get to 1991, I'm sorry, 1992, when Casey's argued, you have eight Republican appointed justices, eight. And only one of them was a Democrat appointment, and he had dissented in Roe, Justice White. So, you know, if it looked like there was ever a time that Roe would be overruled, um, this was going to be it. And states began to become more aggressive 
in adopting abortion laws that were probably inconsistent with Roe. You know, they were testing it. You know, they weren't flatly inconsistent. They were trying to find different restrictions that can be imposed to make it harder to obtain an abortion. And Pennsylvania um, adopted uh, a, a fairly substantial package of abortion laws. The different parts of it. You know, one part required giving uh, pregnant women literature about abortion, and they had to get certain disclosures. Um, another part had to do with um, uh, uh, giving, uh, prohibiting uh, minors from obtaining an abortion, a uh, subject was called a judicial bypass, where a judge can allow uh, uh, an abortion even if the parents don't consent. But the most significant abortion law from Pennsylvania said that married women had to notify their husbands of getting an abortion. They didn't have to get permission. They just had to notify them. Right? That was the most significant one. That in other words, if you're married, uh, you should tell your husband before you get an abortion. That, that was what the law said. All right. Um, Planned Parenthood challenged this regime. And Planned Parenthood made a very um, deliberate strategic choice. And you can say whether it's smarter or not in hindsight. But their choice was to basically force the court to either overrule Roe or affirm Roe. They were not interested in watering down Roe. They said, look, if you uphold this law, you have to overrule Roe. And they wanted to force the court to even entertain reversing Roe. Um, you can listen to the arguments. It was very, the, the lawyer was very clear. It's like, look, if you guys uphold this women, uh, the, the, the spousal notification provision, you're basically reversing Roe. And the right to abortion is dead. I know, a little dramatic, but, you know, they, they were trying to make that point very clear. They wanted the court to own overruling this precedent. All right. The case was argued. And after the argument... There were five votes to overrule Roe. Five. At that point, Roe was about 20 years old. 19 years old. But there were five votes to overrule Roe. Then, something happened. Um, Justice Kennedy had a change of thought. And he switched sides. You know, Roberts not the only one to do this. It happens. And Justice Kennedy formed a triumvirate, a three-member joint opinion with Justice Souter and O'Connor. And they wrote an opinion, which we'll get to. We'll discuss exactly what it did. But the upshot is that there were no longer five votes to uphold Roe. There were also only three votes to support this new Fangle standard. So there was no majority opinion in Casey. Let me say that again. Casey did not generate a majority opinion. We wouldn't get five votes for the Casey standard until 2016. Whole Women's Health was the first case that gave five votes to Casey. Which is why I think the easiest way for the court to proceed is simply say that, that Holman's health misinterpreted Casey. I think that's what Roberts is going to do. He says that case misinterpreted Casey. That's not what Casey said. We we know what Justice Kennedy said, not Justice Kennedy, right? It's one of those businesses. All right. So the, the, the breakdown in Roe, I'm sorry, in Casey was you had a five member majority to um, not overrule Roe, and yet four dissenters would have overruled Roe. But there was no single rationale on what the rule should be. You had three, O'Connor, Kennedy, and Souter. That's a joint opinion. And then you had two. You had Blackman and Stevens, and they had their own thing. They said strict scrutiny all the way. So you don't even know what the standard is. But the upshot is Roe survived, at least in theory. Now, what Casey actually did is very complex. This is probably one of the most significant constitutional law decisions of the 20th century, um, not just because it involves abortion, but because the court develops this very elaborate framework to consider stare decisis precedent. Um, the majority, or the, I keep saying the majority, it's not a majority, the joint opinion 
basically says we would not have voted the way, we would not have voted in the majority in row twenty years earlier. We we wouldn't have. But we will stand by a decision we disagree with, even though we disagree with it, because of the values we identify. Um, you know, if you read Casey in the abstract, oops. if you read Casey in the abstract, I just let that ring. If you read Casey in the abstract, uh, it seems like there's a very good framework to decide when precedent should be uh, followed. But uh, the court doesn't really follow those factors either, right? It's not this sort of framework that's applied to any consistency. So it's a good opinion to study, but it's very hard to fit into con law more broadly. The court overrules precedents all the time, and they don't always consider all these factors. So there you have it. All right, who's next? Oh, Ashley here. Hi, yes, I'm here. Thanks, Ashley. Well, glad you're here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a. I have 53 people here. How many? Let me see the I click. How many absences do we have? 13 people absent. All of whom. Look at this. Who's absent? Last name R. Last name S. Last name S. Last name T. Hmm. Okay. Well, most people I have have last names R, S, and T. Huh, I wonder. All right, but you're here, actually. Thank you, S. Um, I think I'm stupid. I, I, I know people strategically use their absences at the alphabetical order. I'm aware. I know, I know how this works. Um, you're here, actually. I'm not, not venting. You're, you're on the screen. I'm not venting at you. All right. So, actually, the court says that we are reaffirming Roe. And they say this over and over and over. They, a hundred times. We are reaffirming Roe. And this is like their, 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 their expression. What does it mean to reaffirm the essential holding of Roe? We are reaffirm the essential holding of Roe. What, can you just tell me what exactly that means? Um, I think they were just reaffirming the fact that Roe is precedent that allows women to get abortions. And the rest, the four ways they left row kind of show they didn't actually uphold the structure of row at all. All right, well, just Ashley, let me ask you maybe a follow up question if I can, please. What is the es essential holding of row? Maybe, maybe we can start there, right? What's the essential holding of row? Maybe we'll start with that question. Uh, before this case, I thought it would be that abortion was found to be a fundamental uh, right um, and therefore viewed as strict scrutiny, but that's uh, not what they reaffirmed. So, <laughs> Well, according to the majority, so the, the joint opinion, what was the essential holding of Roe they're holding or they're reaffirming? I guess just that women can get an abortion okay. to a certain degree. Yeah, and no, I see you're struggling. It's okay. Yeah, uh, Lauren, Lauren, you here? Lauren? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Lauren, let me ask you the same question I asked Ashley a moment ago. What was the essential holding of Ro Lauren? Um, in very basic terms, I feel like it was that a woman has some right to like her body or something that um, at some point the state cannot interfere with and like where that point is was kind of moved and what that right is was kind of moved in this case. Okay. So let me, let me just repeat what you think, what I think what I heard you say that the essential holding arose that there's some right to abortion that begins at some point in the pregnancy but the specifics weren't very important, right? The, 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 the timing wasn't the essential holding, but the holding that there was some right somewhere at some point. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I wouldn't even go as far as say the timing wasn't the essential holding. It was that the timing was just a place 
that they put in. So they kind of kept the relative timing with like viability. So uh, at the start of class, yeah. I gave you these three questions, right? You know, what restrictions here? What restrictions there? What restrictions, you know, the third? Was all that just sort of dicta? I mean, just what, what was all that stuff? I think it was the court trying to figure out, you know, where is the most logical place to put this in light of everybody's differences of opinion. But that wasn't the holding. No. <laughs> um, no, I guess not. It yes. was it was that they have some right, yeah. I guess so what I said originally and what you repeated. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank thank you. Okay, thank thank you, Lauren. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very very good. All right. Um so look, I, I, I apologize for making uh, Ashley and Lauren just, just struggle with those questions. I think we can all be candid and agree that what the court and the joint opinion did in Casey was to, um, how do I put this, reimagine the road decision, right? They sort of like, you know, it's like when you read a story as a kid and then you read the same story again as an adult and you see it completely differently, right? Or if you watch a movie, like, you know, if you watch an old episode of The Simpsons or Family Guy and like you watch it going, you're just like, oh, I miss those jokes, right? Um, you know, they looked at Roe in a different light and they stripped apart what I think was the most significant portion of Roe, which is why I, I made such a big fuss. What are the three trimester frameworks, right? The one, two, three. Um, that apparently was not necessary. The, the, the framework, this rigid framework, as they call it, um, was not necessary. Um, is it dicta? I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Let's say it's not necessary. Now you might ask yourself, how can three justices overrule five, me- I'm sorry, how can three justices overrule a seven member majority? Can that be done? Can a three member plurality overrule five or seven member majority? The answer is absolutely not. But that's basically what was happening here. Um, you know, if any of you had written a, a legal writing memo where you had a given precedent and you said, oh, that's what we're, that wasn't really the holding. Here's the real holding of the case, right? You get an F, right? If if you had, if someone gave you row and you were asked to write a memo discussing what the holding of row is, and this is what you wrote, you get an F. But but when you're Justice Kennedy, you can do whatever you want because you're the kingmaker or you were the kingmaker. All right. Um, the next thing that stands out to me about the Casey decision, and, and again, I... I, I, I don't like beating up on Justice Kennedy, but the last week of class, it's just, you know, I used to be up on Holmes, not beating up on Kennedy. It's hard to read. It just it just has this sort of this, you know, if I knew you took a philosophy class in college, this sounds like this philosophy paper, just the, the mystery of, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. I just it's, They're just words, words on paper. These matters involving those intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime, choices central to personal dignity and autonomy, are central to the liberty protected by the Fourteenth Amendment. I just it just it reads like a like like a like a C philosophy paper from like freshman you know year. Just it just. The beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood where they formed the compulsion of the state. These considerations begin our analysis of the woman's interest in terminating pregnancy, but cannot end it. Like, I just, I don't know. Like, I, I mean this sincerely. I don't know what he's trying to say. They're just words. And he's just sort of articulating some philosophy that has nothing to do with the case. Um, but this is what we have. Uh, if any of you did the reading for tomorrow for Bergefell, you've seen this with Lawrence, you've seen this. I don't, I don't know what he's saying, but, but Roe at least had the virtue of simplicity. They discussed, you know, right of privacy, which, you know, I, I get, I understand what that means. But here it, it's defining liberty in this sort of very um, philosophical sense. Now, now, Randy actually likes this part. He's very big on this word liberty. Okay, that's fine. Um, Cassidy, that's enough. <laughs> Uh, Justice Kenny, by the way, is a teetotaler. He never drank at all. He never did any drugs. Uh, I think his brother had actually died of an overdose, or had had one of his siblings had a very huge substance abuse problem. So he was very much opposed to drugs. 
And you saw this in Gonzales v. Rage, in fact. I think one of the reasons why Kennedy changed his opinion from Lopez and Morrison to Rage was because if he had a family member who had a, a substance abuse problem. So it's, there you go. Yes, Tori, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if I missed it, but did you say what the essential holding in row was? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think... I think Lauren did a decent job. I think what Lauren said was, is probably in the ballpark is that the 14th Amendment protects some right of abortion. And that's it, right? Beyond that, we don't really know what it is. But that was the essential holding it. There's some right to abortion. And the court can sort of um, define the contours of that along the way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You know, Moses asked, is it all con law philosophy? Um, there's a lot of philosophy premised in American constitutional law. I just don't know what philosophy Kennedy's using. I just, I, I, I you know, I, I it just, I, I just don't know what he's saying, right? Yeah. If, if we want to talk about Madison and, and, and the Enlightenment and these thinkers that influence our Constitution, I think that's fair game. If you want to talk about some of the abolitionist thinkers like Lysander Spooner and Frederick Douglass, I think it's fair game. But Kennedy is not citing anything that influences our Constitution. It's sort of just abstract principles of who knows what. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I don't know. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I, I get really hard on Justice Kennedy, but I'm, I'm grateful he's not in the court anymore. There are no more opinions that I have to teach. We're done. Um, Murray removing his case from the syllabus is actually this great winnowing. Uh, when the benefits of being a professor, we can do that. All right. Um, the next element, though, I think is flatly inconsistent with Roe. Um, we discussed that the interest in protecting fetal life only kicks in at the six-month mark, the third trimester. That was very clear. That was the holding of Roe. There's no – that wasn't dicta. That was holding. Right? But what Casey's plurality said – by the way, uh, plurality, it's a funny word, plurality. Um, I think we defined it in the book. If we don't have it, we should. Plurality – is a Supreme Court opinion that's not joined by five members, right? When there's no single opinion that has five votes, we call it a plurality. I don't know why, right? It's it's a weird word, but that's what we use. Uh, but the Casey plurality says that the state now has an interest in protecting fetal life throughout all nine months. All nine months, Right? That's significant. I think that is – if you had to ask me what was Roe's essential holding, i say that was it, that the state's interest in, in, in protecting fetal life kicks in at viability at six months. That was the holding. But what the Casey opinion says or the Casey joint opinion is that this fetal life interest kicks in at all nine months, which is very significant, which is why today under Casey – the state can impose restrictions on first trimester abortions. That was not allowed under Roe. You couldn't. Under first under Roe, the first trimester was basically open. You couldn't do anything. So now first trimester restrictions can exist. Everyone with me so far? The next big change, which I think is mostly a change in, 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 in nomenclature and naming, but mattered. Oh, uh, Lainey, go ahead, please. I'm, I see your hands up. Sorry, I know this case is confusing. Um, so the central holding in Roe was a woman's right to abort before viability, but Casey upheld Roe and yet said the state has an interest in protecting the fetus all nine months. Correct. Thanks. Correct. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... I, 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 we can criticize and, and, and dunk on Justice. By the way, he, Justice Kennedy didn't write the opinion by himself. It was O'Connor and Souter, but the, but the stuff here, I'm saying, this is Kennedy. This was, no one else could write like this. This is him. O'Connor did not write like this. Souter could not write like this. This is not them. All right. Um, the fourth major change. I'm sorry, Lainey. Go ahead. Put your hand up again. Yeah, I have another question. Um, so this plurality... There's speculation about who wrote which parts, but there's no definitive author for each part. Is that because nobody wanted to be the one who owns 
like personally owns this decision? It was a joint product. And let me just, let me just talk about that for a minute. Um, often on the court, when there's a controversial opinion that requires collaboration, they really do it jointly. So one example you've seen is the Obamacare decision. The dissent by Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito is joint. No one authored it. Now, we all know Scalia wrote parts of it and Kennedy wrote parts of it. Just he, I know because I know how they write. Uh, it's not obvious perhaps to, you know, at first blush, but uh, Kennedy wrote the Medicaid expansion and Scalia wrote the mandate part. Just it's, it's, it's pure Scalia, just the way he writes. Um, on the... In the Casey case, if you're interested, not that it matters, um, Justice Souter wrote the parts on stare decisis. Um, he was very much in favor of precedent. Um, Justice O'Connor, I think, wrote the portions about the um, the women, uh, uh, you know, the, the the spousal notification that you have to notify the wife, uh, the husband. Just it just it, it. We don't know for sure, but we have leaks from the court, and that's what suggests. And Kennedy wrote all this gibberish on liberty. Uh, that's just that's that's him. It just there's no doubt in my mind. Um, you know, we'll get the papers of the justices eventually. Um, the, the way it works is that um, the justices release the papers after they die, but many years later. So Justice Souter, God bless him, bless his heart, said he will release the papers 50 years after his death. He's in his 70s and in very good health. We may not see them for another 75 years from now. No one will care anymore about him, which is completely irrelevant, which is why he's doing it. Um, we don't know about RBG's papers. Um, those are coming out soon. We don't know when. Um, but she was on the court for Casey. Uh, we don't know about Justice Kennedy's papers. Um, probably we will not see these papers uh, for a long time. So we don't know for sure. But there are books written about this. People talk to the justices of their leaks. Yeah, when I'm 120 years old, I'll go check out Justice Souter's papers at this library in New Hampshire. Someone at the uh, Library of Congress told me that the people in New Hampshire have no idea what they're doing, that they're not ready for this, this huge block of papers from Souter. So it's going to be a disaster. Souter's from New Hampshire. That, that's his home. Anyway, but I'll be there. I'll be 120 years old. I'll be ready. I hope you're all there with me. We go, we go on a field trip. Well, you know, uh, 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 a, 20, a class of 2022 Zoom class reunion. We go up there on Zoom and we all look at the library together. I don't know. All right. Questions? All right. The next part of row, I'm sorry, of Casey that's significant is the scrutiny. Casey did not follow the strict scrutiny model. Instead, they sort of applied a new standard. Right, a new standard. Uh, who's next? Aaron, you here? I'm here. Okay, Aaron. What? <clears throat> excuse me. What standard of review, Aaron, did the Casey plurality uh, apply? Undue burden. What is undue burden? What, what does the standard mean? Basically, saying that if the law of the state. Um, implements has an undue burden. Duh. Um, basically, if it makes the access to abortion harder. Okay, well, what do you mean make it harder? Just give me a little bit more, um, uh, a, a little, little bit more insight there. What does it mean they make it harder? The, they say um, substantial obstacle in the path of the woman's choice. Substantial obstacle. Okay, help me out here, Aaron. What does that mean? Um, I mean, I guess in the instance of this case, having to ask the husband for their consent and their opinion is a substantial obstacle because it's not giving the woman the right to like freely choose on her own. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Thanks, Aaron. All right. The court... That keeps saying the court. The plurality adopts what could only be called um, this new standard. Um, generally, restrictions that are reviewed with strict scrutiny fail, right? It's hard to beat strict scrutiny. I think we, we all understand that point. And generally, when you have a rational basis standard, the government wins because you defer. 
So if someone might ask, Josh, isn't this just like an intermediate scrutiny for abortion? I'd love to say yes. But I think this is more severe than intermediate scrutiny, right? If, you know, if like rational basis is here and strict scrutiny is here, undue burden is very close to strict scrutiny. It's, it's, it's not much different. Um, it's unclear even what the difference is at all. Um, so we ask, does a restriction on abortion impose a substantial obstacle, an undue burden, on a woman's ability to obtain an abortion. Now, the law upheld a waiting period, right? That after you go to an abortion clinic, you have to wait 24 hours before you get the procedure done. Does a 24-hour delay impose an undue burden? Well, it's a burden, but it's not undue, right? So it allows some delays in getting the abortion. Um, but the spousal notification, the court says, went too far. Because it, how, how did it put, um, placed the husband's dominion over the wife. I think that, um, I'm paraphrasing just, I think that was O'Connor, just, just the way she writes, I think it was O'Connor, right? Uh, oh, that was it. The, the, the man cannot be given dominion over his wife, like as if it was a parent over a child. And this burden, the court says, was still too great. Um, but what we're doing here is basically weighing how significant of a burden there is. All right. Now, uh, that was uh, Aaron. Uh, James, you here? James? I guess we yes, have... Yeah, thanks, James. James, let me ask you a question, please. Um, was there really any discussion in Casey about whether Pennsylvania's laws actually provide any benefits. We all know about the burden part, but did you see anything in Casey that discusses whether uh, an abortion law provides some sort of benefit? I don't actually see much in Casey about the actual provisions of the Pennsylvania. No, I know, I know. we don't have anything with provisions, but to discuss just in the framework, when we talk about the undue burden framework, about what benefits might be provided. No, other than part about informed choice, maybe. Okay, good. Let me, so let me just give you an example, which I think will be easy to figure out. So, so the state says, just hypothetically, right? The state says, we want women to be given um, 24 hours to obtain an abortion, right? I mean, they go in, they have to receive some literature, they get a statement, but they can't do the procedure for, for a full day. Why would the state enact that law, James? What's the thinking there? I mean, I think if you're looking for state interest, that they want a woman for this very big decision in her life to not make it rashly to think about it. R rashly, not rationally, but rationally, right? Just like, I'm not sure I heard you yeah. correctly. Okay, right, yeah. In other words, they, want, they don't want to make a rash decision. They want to take their time to think it through, right? And the thinking is, if a woman's given you know another 24 hours, maybe she'll have second thoughts and she keeps the fetus and it goes to term, right? Maybe. Oh, you have to agree, but that's, that's what the state would argue, right? What is the state's interest in having the husband notification provision? Just to, pretend, pretend you're a government lawyer. I don't care if you agree or not. Just pretend you're a government lawyer for a minute. Uh, that this is an important family decision and that the quite possibly, depending on what you think the rights of are of that fetus, that the husband in a marriage maybe has some rights as well. All right. So at least the state can credibly argue that there's some reason why the this law was enacted. There's some benefit, right? For probably. Okay. okay. You, know, you don't have to agree, just that the state could argue it. Uh, the reason why I'm making this fuss is uh, Holman's health would come back, you know, almost 30 years later and discuss the benefit component. Now, I, I've read Casey many times Casey doesn't, uh, thank you, James. Casey doesn't discuss benefits, right? But I think you can argue that a law that has no benefits is all burden. In other words, if you have a law that doesn't actually give any benefits, when you sort of balance the benefits and the burdens, 
If there's no benefits, I'll burn it. So even if the burden is not very substantial, it becomes undue because there's no actual benefit being provided. I think that's the best way of reconciling Casey with Holman's health. I don't think it's I don't think they have to do that, but the best way to reconcile is to say that when you weigh the costs and the benefits, if there are no actual benefits, even a slight cost seems greater magnitude. Right? In other words, why is the state making the doctors go through these hoops if there's no actual benefit for it? Now, I think the flip side and what the uh, conservative wing would argue is that uh, it's not your job to decide whether the benefits are real. If the state asserts a benefit, that's enough. And this is why James like, maybe, maybe that's what they were thinking, right? Um, under the undue burden standard, the court doesn't say whether you defer to the state's interest. It focused almost exclusively on the undue burden standard. All this is a long way of saying that Casey did not resolve everything. That Casey was designed to resolve the case before it. And it left the court sort of um, to redefine, if you will. I mean, look at it this way. I think Casey redefined Roe. And I think Holman's Health redefined Casey. Right. I think each subsequent abortion decision sort of redefines what came before it, which is why I think it's going to be actually pretty easy for the court to just say, no, that's not what we meant. We misinterpreted it. Go back. Go back to start. All right. Questions so far in Casey? Well, I promise we'll get to the other cases, but they're much easier. <coughs> Questions in Casey so far? No? All right. Uh, the next part of Casey I want to discuss is about stare decisis. Um, stare decisis is an old Latin phrase, which means uh, you stand by the decisions of the court, right? You stand by precedent. Um, and uh, who's next? Uh, uh, Bianca, you hear Bianca? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thanks, Bianca. Bianca, the very first page of the joint opinion, the very first sentence, has this sentence that's just burned in my retina. Just I can never unsee it. Liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt. Liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt. What does that sentence mean? Bianca, help us out here. Um, <laughs> I know it is. I my column professor asked me the same damn question when I was in, when I was a two thousand one or two L. Can't remember, but I guess it was a two L at that point. What the hell does that mean, Bianca? Help, just just let's start. Let's start with maybe line by line. What's a jurisprudence of doubt? Let's just maybe take the take the ending first. A jurisprudence of doubt. Jurisprudence maybe of like... doubt. Yeah. What the hell does that mean? It kind of makes you think of like um, the way that they would that the court would scrutinize, like the standard of like is it strict scrutiny or is it the way they would? What does it mean to doubt jurisprudence? To to have doubt about a case? What does that mean? To have doubt about. Like the outcome of case? No, no, to have doubt about a precedent itself. A jurisprudence of doubt. What does it mean when you have doubt about cases? That you just, you don't agree with it. I and guess. what happens if you don't agree with a case? Um, you could try to, I guess, overturn it or decide. Ah, right, so in a okay. jurisprudence of doubt, cases are getting overruled, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that problematic? If, 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 if precedents are in doubt, if they're in question. Because, um, um, where is it? I know in this case they talked about, like, weakening the... Where is it? Like, basically, like, weakening the... 
legitimacy of the court and the decisions that they make. Okay, right. They're, but just so let's just let's just stick with the one sentence. All right, a juror's prince of doubt is when the presence of the court are in jeopardy; they might be overruled. Okay, so now the first part: liberty finds no refuge in a juror's prince of doubt. What's that mean? What's the relationship between liberty and precedent? Well, the precedent should be upholding people's liberties. How, how, how are liberties secure when precedents are changing? They're changing. No, no question again. Is the yes or no question? Is, oh. is, can our freedoms be secure if precedents are in flux, if precedents are changing? No. Why not? Because, I mean, kind of like these cases here, one decision could limit your freedoms like more than the next one. Ah, so people might not be secure in their freedoms if the court changes the precedence. Right. Okay. I think good. Thank you, Bianca. Very good. Um, liberty finds a refuge in jurisprudence of doubt. I think what they're getting at is People can't be secure in their freedoms if the precedents are changing, which is sort of this, this, this obvious point, right? If the court overrules a decision that provides some sort of freedom, then yes, that, that, that freedom is no longer there. Um, and the court gives an example, right? That for 20 years, women have grown up with the understanding this right exists. And they've formed their lives based on this, and they, they, they structure their relationships and their and their. And their, and their work habits and things, knowing that abortion is permissible. And it would be unfair to their liberty to take that right away. Okay, I think that's what they're getting. Any questions in that part so far? Then the court goes on to discuss legitimacy, which, which is this word that people throw around, I think, far too often. Um... The, the court says that if we overrule Roe now under fire, it would subvert the court's legitimacy. Seth, you here? Yes, I am. Seth, what does that mean if the court overruled a case under fire? What, what does that mean? Public opinion. What public opinion? What's full sentence? <clears throat> um, well... Based on the fire of wanting to have Roe overturned, mm -hmm. so all everything that the uh, one you know the Republicans at the time were doing was aiming to try to get Roe reversed, and so I think that's what they're talking about with trying to do this under fire. Okay, so if the court were to overrule Roe in, in, in response to all these or, or in light of all these public criticisms, what might people think happened at the court? I'm sorry. Could you could you repeat the last part of that? Okay. All these people are saying to the court, overrule Roe. Mm -hmm. And then the court overrules Roe. How might that decision be perceived? That they can be influenced by what society is saying. Ah, they can be influenced at work. Right? So what Souter, and again, this was Souter, what Souter is saying here is that the court overrules the precedent in light of this public pressure. People think, oh, wait a minute, that worked. Let's try it again. Now, have we seen in our course judges making decisions in response to pressure? Of course we have. West Coast Hotel v. Parish, among others, right? I would put the Chiefs Obamacare decision in that category. Um, judges routinely reflect public opinion in their, in their cases. So the, the things discussed here all sound great, but I just don't think they're that special. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have time to go through the Scalia dissent, and, and I encourage you to read it. But I think Scalia, oh man, he was pissed here. Uh, because he had, he had five votes to get the white whale to overrule around and lost it. And he was pissed. He was angry. There was actually a story of Kennedy and Scalia were actually neighbors. They lived very close to each other in Virginia. And there was actually a story that they went for a walk um, while this case was ongoing. And Kennedy told Scalia, don't worry, you know, everything's fine. We're going to be good. 
And the next day, Kenny like changed his mind. <laughs> and he switched positions. So this is why Scalia and Kenny hated each other. Oh, they didn't hate each other. I shouldn't say that's, that's wrong. But they had this long, long feud. And you see this in all the gay rights cases where Scalia's like, what are you doing, Kennedy? This is all wrong. And then Kenny's like, whatever. I got the votes. It doesn't matter what you think. Um, but uh, that's a common trend you see with the Kennedy opinions. Just the, the dissents don't matter. All right. All right. So a question about the majority. <laughs> question with uh, I keep saying the majority, the plurality. It basically was a majority, but, but it wasn't really. Okay, so we get to the, the dissents. Uh, we have Justice Rehnquist, I'm sorry, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who says, um, you know, this is not reaffirming Roe, right? This is not about reaffirming Roe. And Scalia says, this is not sorry, decisis, you've rewritten Roe. Uh, the, the dissenters would apply a rational basis standard to abortion, treat it as a non fundamental right, and all five laws would be upheld. All right. Uh, I wish I had more. I could do an entire class on Casey, but these other cases I have to teach now, so I can't. Questions on Casey? No? All righty. Uh, Smee, how are you here? Yes, I'm here. How's the coloring going? It's going well. Can we see the artwork or no? Uh, she erased it already. Was it a marker? No, she had a, like, I gave her a little whiteboard and so she was drawing on there. Yeah, I got my kid a whiteboard, but the marker she's not old enough yet. So I gave her chalk, which seems like a good idea to start drawing chalk on the walls. Um, anyway, it's <laughs> things thing to learn. Okay. All right. You want to give me the facts, please, and hold Ms. Healthy Heller said? Yes. So the, in 2013, Texas has to... Give me just a second. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. There's it's, a bunch of things going on. In it's okay. I know, I know how this works. It's all right. Um, so in 2013, Texas had two controversial restrictions, and it said that doctors who provided abortions, they had to have privileges at a hospital within 30 miles. Which is, what does that mean, privileges? Just to understand what that means? Um, that they had access to the hospital so that if anything happened, they would be able to go take the patient there. Okay, good. Just I'll come back for one second. What admitting privileges means is that you're able to actually go to a hospital and perform services there, right? So let's say you provide an abortion to a woman and then she has some sort of complication that you, the person who did the procedure, can then help the patient at the hospital. It's not, you know, some other physician, you can do it, right? Everyone understands, so it's the idea that the same person who does the procedure can later go to an ER if they need to, to, to do, you know, some sort of surgery or whatever. Okay, all right, go on, Smiha. Yeah. So, um, uh, oh, and then the second provision was they had to have these uh, standards um, of certain facility, um, of, I think, surgical centers, and a lot of abortion clinics or clinics that were providing the service didn't have the necessary funds to be able to meet those standards. Good. Um, and then because of that, a lot of abortion clinics within Texas had to shut down because okay, good. they couldn't meet those standards. Good, good. Thank you, Tamina. So uh, on the second point, they're called ambulatory surgical standards. Uh, sorry, a ambulatory surgical centers. What does that mean? You have to be set up to perform surgery. Right now, um, some clinics in Texas were covered. So, for example, the Planned Parenthood clinic on 45. If you ever drive by UH, it's this huge building around 45. They have uh, the surgical standards there. Uh, I think the Planned Parenthood clinic in Austin also is covered, and San Antonio as well. Uh, Holman's Health is a smaller clinic. These are scattered throughout the states. There's one I think in Brownsville, one in El Paso. Uh, the, the, you know, there's the, some in the Valley. Uh, they're sort of spread out. But these were smaller clinics that did not perform surgical abortions. They performed what are called medical abortions, right? There were certain pills you can give a person and which basically induce an abortion, right? Uh, they can usually be used earlier on in the pregnancy. Once you get to a certain point, they're not, you can't really use them anymore. 
Um, but you can usually take these pills and, and, and the fetus passes. Um, in some cases, you need to have a, a procedure after the fact uh, called a d and &E. I don't want to get into details now, but you can do different things to uh, take care of things after the fact. I'll leave it there. Um, but this law required all clinics in Texas to have these surgical standards and the doctors had to give, um, uh, had to obtain admitting privileges. Okay. Even if the doctor would never be one to provide medical care at a hospital, and even if there was no uh, surgery being performed. Now, uh, who's next? Uh, Douglas, are you there? Douglas, why did Texas enact these laws? I'm asking that question very vaguely, but I'll let you run with it. Why did Texas enact these laws, Douglas? He's not here. Rachel, are you here? I'm here. Okay, Rachel. Why did Texas enact these laws? I'm asking the question very vaguely. Okay, uh, Texas said that they enacted these laws in order to better regulate health and safety. Okay, so let's let's do that one first. I, I sense the other part of the answer coming okay. up in a second, which is why I asked the question openly. How, in Texas's view, does this law protect promote public safety? It promotes public safety because if doctors have admitting privileges, if something goes wrong, it's a more seamless transition yes. from the clinic to Good. the hospital. Right. In other words, the and patient knows Dr. Jones, and then Dr. Jones is the one who actually uh, does the procedure to the hospital. Okay, good. What about the surgical standards? Surgical standards means that if there was a complication, they'd be more likely to, one, take care of it there, but there's also um, increased benefits for surgical abortions. A higher yeah. standard of care would mean less likelihood for complications, infections, or you know different things that come up. All right, so I, I just, I just, I just discern a, a, a little bit of cynicism in your voice right now, just, 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 just a tad. Uh, why do you think Texas enacted these laws? Uh, it's just putting aside the, the state's rationales. Um, well, they enacted them because they wanted to place obstacles towards getting abortions. Just the, just the law itself being put into place. I mean, it didn't even matter once this opinion happened because most of those clinics had already had to shut down. Um, most of them never reopened after this. So I think particularly because they admit there's no evidence in the record that there's a benefit. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit cynical just, about the actual intentions of the provisions. Yeah, just, 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 just a tad. And Brigitte's not so uh, delicate with her answer uh, in the chat. Um, look, it was a conservative legislature. Um, this was a bill which you might recall, uh, Wendy Davis, uh, she actually ran for Congress, she lost this past term, um, filibuster with their pink sneakers on. You might remember this uh, from the uh, 2013 or so. Um, you know, after the filibuster, they just called a special session and reenacted the exact same law again. So, um, you know, it, 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 the law was passed uh, by a pro-life legislature, um, and they were trying to uh, impose laws, right? Now... I'll be a little bit less cynical than Rachel, but but I, I, I respect your cynicism. I think you can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? I think they recognize that this would make it hard to get an abortion, but they also thought it would make it safer. In other words, um, I think most people act with two motivations. Um, in general, let me just make this point generally. I think uh, people have a bad habit of, of saying people motivated by a single focus, right? They're doing this only because of X, and I think that oversimplifies how humanity works. We are all complex people who act for a lot of reasons. Uh, some good motivations, some bad motivations. Um, when you have a legislature with 100-odd members, uh, people have different intents. So I think when you look at a law like this, there are a lot of reasons why this law was enacted. Right? Does Casey require you to look at the effect of the law that's imposing undue burden? Or does Casey require you to look at the intent of those who enacted it? Right? Uh, does Casey let you say that the benefits that the government cited are not real? Right? Um, okay, Moses says you don't like Kennedy. Yeah. Politicians represent... Uh, when you like, panic me disagree, right? Yeah, I, I, politics is just very unimportant for me in this class. I, I, I think it's it's tricky when, you know, a court looks at a um, legislation, here's what they intended. Well, which one? 
you know, there are hundreds of members, right? Which one are you talking about? And how do you know for sure if they intended? Uh, but I think a central component of Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence is arguing that members of a government have a bad intent, that they enacted this law with the wrong intent. And you'll see this a lot in the gay marriage decisions we'll read for tomorrow. It's just a very strong component. Um, now, Texas did have some evidence that there was a risk of medical complications. It's a small risk, and I think Texas acknowledges that. I think Texas also argued that there was a, uh, uh, I think the word used was seamless, Rachel, that if you have a doctor with admitting privileges, there's a seamless transition, which is true. Uh, but it's also true that very few uh, women who obtain these medical abortions ever actually have to go to a doctor. It usually passes in the home. Um, and you don't have to go to a, you know, a hospital. It's actually a relatively safe procedure. Um, Texas also had evidence that there are some uh, fairly egregious violations of health laws. There's a doctor in Philadelphia named Kermit Gosnell, which was uh, one of the progenitors. So he, this was this was awful. He had basically these this really unsanitary uh, abortion clinic, and he had kept many of the fetuses in these like basically jars. He didn't dispose them properly. It, it was it was gruesome. And I think that was one of the things that motivated the idea that these doctors need more regulations. Um, you know, I asked, I think it was Gavin almost an hour ago, didn't Roe say that you could impose restrictions on the qualifications of doctors? Um, the answer is yes. Um, but you can't impose restriction to create a, a, a burden on abortion. Uh, but what if there are enough benefits? So the, 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 the line between Roe and Casey and Holman's Health is not straight. Um, but at least for now, there were five votes in, in Casey. I'm sorry, five votes in Holman's Health. And Justice Breyer with the majority opinion. And, and for, for whatever you criticize Justice Kennedy, Breyer can write a tight opinion. He wrote a very easy to understand opinion. It's clear. There's no philosophy. There's no discussions in the mystery of the universe. I know exactly what Breyer's getting at. So as much as I dump in Kennedy, thank you, Justice Breyer. I think it's an easy opinion to teach, right? So at least it's, it's, you know, it's long and tedious, but at least I know what the holding is, right? There's actually some, some law here. So thank you, Justice Breyer. Um, Breyer writes that uh, with the undue burden standard, we have to consider whether the law imposes benefits. Right. If there are no medical benefits, then the law imposes a burden that's undue. I'll say that again. If the law has no medical benefits, then the burden is undue. Right. In other words, why is a state burdening abortion if there really is no benefits there? Right. If, if this is a law that, that, that doesn't help women at all. Why, why the restriction? This isn't about helping the fetus. It's about helping the mother, they said. And if it's not helping the mother, why have the rule at all? Okay. That is, I think, a reading of Casey. Maybe not the best reading, but it's a reading of Casey. Okay. But the dissenters come back and say, Texas has come forward with evidence to show that there are benefits. Maybe they're not huge, maybe they're small, maybe they're rare, but there's some benefits. Justice Breyer, though, says these benefits are not enough, right? You know, there's no evidence that these sorts of things happen on, on a regular basis. They're very rare. We don't think that these benefits are enough to justify so substantial a burden to shut down clinics in all these cities. Right, in other words... Even though the state came forward with some purported benefits, which Rachel was quite cynical of, um, they're not enough. All right now, going back to the to the Casey case, and I, I forgot who I asked this a few minutes ago. I think it was James actually. Uh, you know, did the court scrutinize the legitimacy of the purported benefits. And again, it's not in your case book, and James made that point. He was he was exactly correct. But the short answer is not really. Did, did they really discuss, you know, what the benefit is of giving women 24 hours to think about an abortion? Not really. They said, well, the state thinks it promotes fetal life. That's good enough for us. Uh, so I think the upshot is Justice Breyer um, 
closed a loophole in the Casey plurality. And Justice Kennedy joined that opinion. So I think that's a good enough uh, you know, indication of where Casey was. But, but without question, Casey was sort of here. And then you went a little bit further with the, um, the Holman's Health Standard. Questions on Justice Breyer's majority opinion in uh, Holman's Health? Yes, Lady, go ahead. So the 24-hour waiting period did not offer a benefit, and we are... Well, it, 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 it did, but it's not really clear what that benefit was. In other words... I think Justice Breyer would probably say the 24-hour waiting period is not a real benefit. It's just it's just a way to frustrate women. I think that's what but he would probably what say. what I was getting to is um, it's not considering the state's interest. Or the state, okay, the state stated that their interest was the woman's health, and the state didn't really state that the interest was protecting the fetus. Right. Well, I, I, I don't know if I understand your question. What, what, let's try it again. In Casey... There was no scrutiny of the state's interest. The state gave an interest, and that's good enough for us. Here in Holman's Health, the court is carefully scrutinizing whether the state's interest is legitimate or maybe might be what you call a pretext. This is racial cynicism a minute ago, right? They're saying one thing, but they really mean something else, right? I mean, this is, again, the central element of Kennedy's framework where he says, I don't believe the government's acting with good motivations. I think they're acting with, you know, not good vibrations, but bad vibrations, right? They're, they're acting with bad motivations. Um, and the court can scrutinize that. You know, think of, you know, to use another analogy, yik quo, right? We act with the evil eye and the evil hand, right? And that's that's Kennedy's entire existence. I think government's acting with bad motivations. And, then, and he uses this in, in so many cases. Um, uh, it, he doesn't like the idea of mixed motives where maybe the government has different motivations. Maybe they simultaneously want to promote health and to frustrate abortions. Maybe both both things can be true. But to Kennedy, that, that just doesn't matter. This this is, uh, well, he didn't write this one, but it, it's a very Kennedy-esque opinion. By the way, this was, uh, Holman's health was decided the same week as Fisher II. So the same week that Justice Kennedy voted to uphold the affirmative action program, he voted here this way which was this reversal of two other Kennedy opinions. So it did, this was a very weird week for Kennedy. We basically reversed himself in two cases. It's a very, very, that was a bizarre week. I remember it well. All right, questions on the, on the Holman's Health Majority? No? Professor, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, James. So if we were evaluating this now, we would try to, I guess, weigh the benefits versus the burden? When you say now, you mean year 20, you mean November of 2020? No, 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 no. November of 2020, this is upheld for sure. Um, <laughs> But you mean in 2016, you're asking me. So the, then now under this, under Whole Woman's Health, we would try to go through the, is this an actual benefit um, versus... Yeah, benefit. yeah, I yeah, I think just, James, let me address your question. I think I'm getting it. You would have to assert whether the state of benefits legitimate or if it's protectual, if it's a pretext. That, that's, what, that's what the Breyer opinion is getting. It's like, look, has there ever actually been women who have bled out at a, an abortion clinic? Okay, maybe like a couple, right? Maybe it's happened in a very small number, but just maybe not even in Texas. That sort of minuscule risk, right? The, the, that sort of trivial benefit is not enough to justify the substantial burden of shutting down these claims altogether, right? Maybe there's something else the government can do to address this, you know? I mean, look, I mean, we can be candid for a moment. If a woman starts bleeding out at an abortion, like they're going to call an ambulance, right? They're not going to operate her on the spot, right? They're going to call 911, and the abortion doctor is not going to go to the hospital there. They'll put her in the ambulance, and then the ER, you know, physician will treat the person. Right? That that's how it works in every state in the union. Uh, but Texas says, well, we want to have a special 
um, practice where uh, an abortion doctor would be able to travel with the patient in the hospital, I'm sorry, the ambulance, so to speak, and be able to perform the surgery right there. I mean, it's just, it, it, it strikes me as not very realistic that that would ever happen. So the question becomes, is the court going to be in the business of saying, okay, that's bullshit, that's not the real reason, or, okay, you've given us a legitimate reason, that's good enough for us, right? It, that, that's, the, that's the inquiry, right? We all agree this is rare. I think Texas conceded it's rare. But what's the role of the state to scrutinize, I'm sorry, the role of the court to scrutinize that, that interest? So, James, did I answer your question a little bit? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Good question. All right. Um, all right, so I think I'm done with the majority in Holman's health. Uh, Justice Thomas wrote a very Justice Thomas dissent. He's like, screw all this, right? Um, all the tiers of scrutiny are, are basically fake. Uh, you know, we have footnote four, which says we don't review um, unenumerated rights stringently, but abortion is treated even more rigidly than um, uh, enumerated rights. And he was thinking about the Second Amendment here. That, that, that's what he was out of mind. Again, why, why is it gun rights treated so poorly and abortion rights treated so, so favorably? That's what he was getting at. Um, he writes, the court should abandon the pretense that this is just anything other than policy preferences, right? It's just a policy. Okay. All right. I have a 10 minutes left. Good. Questions on the majority or the dissent in whole women's health? No? Okay. All right, let's go into the third case. Uh, June Medical versus Russo. Um, I don't think we're going to add this case to the case book. I don't think it does enough work. And I'm pretty sure by the time our next book goes to print, we'll have another abortion case to decide. But, but maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but this is sort of like a like an intermediary case. I know that doesn't make much sense to you because you don't really care about con law after the semester, but it makes a big deal to me because this is a transition case, right? We went from Justice Kennedy, the majority, and Casey, and in Holman's Health, he's off the court, and now he starts seeing Roberts signaling that he's going to reverse this. That's how, that's how Roberts works. He never does anything right away. He takes like a decade. It takes forever. Um, you know, I'm very impatient with Conwell, right? But he just drags things on. And he starts saying, well, maybe in the future we'll do something. We're not going to do it here. He always gives you one last chance to fix things. That's Roberts' approach. So here we have a law from, the, from Louisiana. And the Louisiana law is very similar to the Texas law. In fact, it was enacted around the same time. And the Louisiana law says, again, you have to have the admitting privileges. Uh, it doesn't have the surgical standard requirements, just the admitting privileges. Um, now, no offense, Louisiana, but it's a smaller state. Um, and by definition, women would have to drive fewer miles to obtain an abortion. This is actually became an important issue in litigation. You know, there are some places in Texas, if you're down in the valley or, or at West Texas, where you, know, you might have to drive, you know, eight or 10 hours to get to a clinic. Although the valley is a trickier spot because you're basically right near Mexico. Uh, if you're in West Texas, you go to New Mexico and actually it's actually quicker to go there than to go to Austin. But anyway, but my point is within the state, you have to drive quite far. Um, in Louisiana, the smaller clinics were shut down, but there were still fewer miles that women would have to drive to get an abortion. But the law in all other regards was basically basically the same. Just the differences were, were not very significant. This case goes to the court. Four votes to uphold the law in its entirety. I mean, so to, to declare the entire law unconstitutional. You have Breyer again, Ginsburg, so do I work, Okay. And Breyer's like, look, this follows naturally from Holman's health. Right? It's almost the exact same law. You look at the benefits and the burdens. There's no meaningful benefit to this law. Therefore, We can't uphold it under the under the Holman's Health Standard. All right. 
I didn't even assign the uh, the plurality opinion, the broad opinion, because I don't think it matters. It's basically a restatement of Holman's health, so I didn't I didn't make, make you waste your time to read it. I did ask you to join. I'm sorry to read the Roberts opinion, which is just like you know a fascinating study to this guy's psychology. Just I, I, I you know I I, I I don't I don't think I'll ever understand Roberts fully, but this is a very good window into his soul, just of how he approaches the world. Um. He was a dissenter in Holman's health. He dissented. No one asked the court to overrule Holman's health in this case. And Roberts is like, we're not going to rule this case. Don't even ask us to do it. Next case, they will. Next case, they'll ask to overrule Holman's health. And also, they'll probably ask to overrule Fisher as well. And it's going to come down the pike somewhere soon. Okay. Roberts acknowledges that the Louisiana law is nearly identical to the Texas law from Holman's health. Very, very similar. And Robert says, stare decisis tells us to treat like cases alike. So only under the doctrine of stare decisis, Louisiana law is unconstitutional. And then Roberts tries to give a theory of stare decisis, um, not like you know, liberty finds a refuge in jurisprudence of doubt. It's much more sober, much more serious. Um, he explains why courts stand by precedence. You notice he doesn't cite Casey. <laughs> he does not cite Casey. You think the most important decision of the last hundred years of Sarah decisis he'd cited, Roberts doesn't even mention it. This is like when Roberts doesn't mention Morris and the Olson and Seal Law. It just it doesn't matter. He doesn't want to distract from what he's trying to do here. But then after saying he's going to stand by Holman's health, he says, but by the way, it's wrong. Right? He says, Casey did not focus on the benefits of an abortion law. Okay? Casey did not ask to weigh the benefits and the burdens. <laughs> Casey was not about a balancing test. Robert says, we're not able as judges to assign weight to know how important a state's interest is. All right? The court is not equipped to weigh the costs and benefits of an abortion regulation. That's not a job for the courts. All you focus on is whether the obstacle is substantial. That, my friends, is the future. And that was before Justice Ginsburg passed away. Um, I thought there were five votes over a row, not row, to overall uh, Holman's health before RBG passed. Now this is a, a given. The only question is when and where it happens. I don't know which case it's going to be. Uh, I think the court's going to maybe take its time, but in the next year or two, that's probably going to be the scaling back of Holman's health. Um, that's what's probably lying ahead. Um, because all Roberts has to say is that Holman's health was a mystery of Casey. I already told you about this. And therefore we go back to the Casey standard. And if you don't believe me, go to the very end of the PDF. Um, Justice Kavanaugh lays out the math. He says, five members of the court reject Holman's health. Roberts, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh. So arguably, Holman's health has already been overruled. This is what Kavanaugh is trying to push, and, and, and some of the lower courts have actually agreed. In fact, the at least two circuits I'm aware of basically said Holman's health has already been overruled. So in the Sixth Circuit, I think the Eighth Circuit, memory serves, the lower courts have said that Holman's health has already been overruled. And we're back to Casey. So this is an area where things are very much in, uh, in change, in flux. All right. Questions on June Medical.
Questions on geomedical. Yes, Simia, go ahead. I have a quick question about what you just said, just related to all of the cases and Kavanaugh's opinion. Um, so Kavanaugh's saying that whole women's health is going to be overturned, and then we're going to go No, 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 no. He said it already is overturned. Okay, it already is overturned. That's what he's saying. If it's overturned, we would go to the Casey standard. But isn't the Casey standard still similar to what the whole women's health is? Because that one still talks about the undue burden standard. Or yes. It's, like, it's only undue burden, but not the benefits of the restriction. In other words, in whole women's health, Justice Breyer said you have to weigh the benefits against the burdens. What Kavanaugh and Roberts are getting at is, no, 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 there's no balancing. We don't care whether the law actually provides any meaningful benefits. Right? All, all we ask is, does this impose an undue burden? So, so maybe making a woman drive eight hours for an abortion would be an undue burden. Right? But that, that, would, that question has nothing to do with whether the, the, there's actually a risk of surgery complications that you need these standards. Right? Because let's say, let's say that there are, there, there's two clinics in Austin. Right? One clinic is Planned Parenthood, has all the surgery stuff. The other one is Holman's Health. They don't have these things. It's making women drive 15 minutes to this side of Austin undue burden? No. So that means you can close one and leave the other one open. Right? So the upshot is the state can impose restrictions um, so long as they don't impose an undue burden. But it doesn't matter if the restriction itself gives a benefit. Right? Because in a lot of these cities, there are multiple clinics, right? Uh, you know, uh, in, in Austin or San Antonio and Houston, the small clinics would shut down, but the bigger ones can stay open. And I guess I, I think the clinics would argue that, you know, there's going to be longer waits and, you know, there'll be the more demand for their doctors. Uh, but that price still wouldn't be enough. That makes sense? Right. I mean, that's the upshot. In in um, Holman's Health, it's I, I think people might agree. I don't, I don't know everyone, but driving eight hours is probably a bit of a burden. Maybe, maybe not. Right. But you at least focus on whether the burden's there. With Breyer, the distance of driving doesn't even matter. All that matters is, is there actually any health benefits? If the answer is no, we don't consider how long you're having to drive. That's just irrelevant because there's no benefits. The burden is basically satisfied automatically. Yeah, Tori, go ahead. Uh, I I think my brain it might just be like going off into a rabbit hole, but does this not give like conservative legislatures just the opportunity to make whatever frivolous petty laws that they want to make, like solve this riddle, find this key, do whatever, like, you know what I mean? If they're not really looking at the best well, let me, laws. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me just describe your, <laughs> instead of using petty frivolous, I'll, I'll use your, uh, it's maybe a little different language. I think states are going to get bold and they're going to try to enact laws that push the boundaries of what, what abortion laws could be upheld. I don't know. I mean, necessarily, I don't know what the court will wind up, holding, right? Even if the court says we go back to Casey, that doesn't mean all laws survive. Um, some states have what are called trigger laws. Uh, I think someone mentioned that in the chat. And what a trigger law means is, by the way, I have a minute left. You have to go. That's fine. But I'm going to finish answering your question. What a trigger law means is if the court ever overruled Roe, then abortion laws would be legal in their entirety. Um, so there are some states that would just flat out ban abortions. I don't think the court would go quite that far uh, but I think what we'll probably see is uh, a ban on certain late-term procedures. Uh, we'll probably see pushing up the line of when the state bans it, 25 weeks, 24 weeks, 23 weeks, when, when is it allowed. Uh, um, that's what we're probably going to see. I'm sorry, Shawnee, were you next? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, for 30 minutes, uh, you, you'll... You'll, you'll be first tomorrow. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So, Tori, did I answer your question a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. All right. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm being sincere. I don't know the answer. I think, I think you know, things are sort of unclear. Uh, but I, I think the sort of trigger laws are probably uh, unlikely the court goes back quite that far. I don't think there are five. There may be two votes for that, but there are five. Okay. What else? Questions. All right. Uh, I started the minute poll. Let me try to summarize a bit as best as I can. Um, the the uh, the abortion cases. I think you need to 
think about them in terms of what year I'm asking you the question. This is a this is a um, um, this is this is an issue where 1973 and 1992 and 2016 and 2020 actually do make a difference. Um, if you're in the 1970s, the answer is Roe. You have a fundamental right, and laws burdening that right are reviewed with strict scrutiny. And you have the three trimester framework. If you talk about 1992, you have Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, we don't have a fundamental right with strict scrutiny. We have an undue burden standard. And we ask ourselves if the laws are uh, imposing substantial obstacle to obtaining an abortion. Uh, at least Holman's Health made clear that um, if there's no benefit, we don't have to think about the burden, right? We don't even ask about it, right? We can just skip right to saying there's no benefit. That's into the case. But I think the June medical standard sets five votes say we don't do that anymore. Now we focus back on the Casey standard and perhaps even more watered down than that. All right, Denver, go ahead. Let's see if a question. So if we can only use row, uh, what standard would we be applying? You would apply the tri trimester framework from row. So do you want to do it under like a strict scrutiny standard? Or only the end of the I standard? think strict scrutiny doesn't really mean anything, but yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's not really, you're applying the trimester framework. That's what you're doing. Got it. All right. Thank you. Sliding scale. All right. Anything else? All right. I'll be back here around 1230 for office hours. Uh, and tomorrow we have a long day. Uh, we might go a little bit late. A lot of cases in one day, but we'll get it in. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'll talk to you soon.